Hi, everyone online. Um, yeah, you can see in the chat, Caroline's put that we're having trouble with the camera. So Zoom doesn't detect camera in the room. <laughs> so we're just going to go with the slides instead. Virtually. We'll make two. Um, people online, if you have questions as you go, you can stick them in the chat or you can put your hand up um, when we when we come to the questions as well. So let's get started, shall we? So we've got, um, yeah. Welcome everyone first to the SHW Cross Theme Seminars. Um, so we've got three speakers across our themes today. Um, we're going to start out with Professor Peter McPherson, who's going to talk to us about some tuberculosis case finding, uh, so using some historical data. Uh, Fred Ho, who will talk to us about COVID-19 pandemic and effects on uh, cardiometabolic risk factors. And interest as well. And then finally, we have R Ronan McCabe, who will talk to us about corporal reality and some thoughts on the social ontology of health. So we're quite diverse um, set of speakers, and we hope you enjoy them. So we're going to have 12 minutes each for the speakers um, and five minutes for questions. And I'll let it go, Peter. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be asked to speak today. And so I'm going to be speaking about this topic here, and, and you may be asking why on earth are we talking about tuberculosis in the 1950s in, in Glasgow? And well, what I'm going to try and do during this talk, try and convince you that what we did in Glasgow in the 1950s is very relevant for how we manage tuberculosis globally um, today. So I think some really interesting data, um, and, and hopefully you'll find it interesting too as well. I'm going to try and get rid of some of these sorts of windows so I can actually see what I'm doing. Is that all right? Yeah, perfect. Okay. And now I just need to work out how to move slides. There we go. Okay, so what do we mean by systematic screening or active case finding for tuberculosis? Well, this is going out into the community and finding people who might have tuberculosis and screening them, diagnosing their TB and getting them onto treatment. And the whole rationale here is, is that by finding people early, they won't transmit it much to other people in their households, in their community, and will interrupt transmission of tuberculosis. And so this systematic screening, you know, it's one of the longest running screening programs that we've ever done in the world. It started back in the 1940s in, in North America, in cities like New York, St. Louis, Baltimore, Buffalo, and even up in the Arctic North um, of Canada amongst Inuit populations. Um, and so this is data taken from a paper that Jonathan Golab Hopkins put out um, nearly, you know, nearly 20 years ago now, showing all of the studies that were done between 1940 and 1970, where there was mass screening for tuberculosis with chest X-ray um, in the community. Um, and it's so really interesting. We had this whole body of work in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. And then WHO came along in 1974 and said, the policy of indiscriminate tuberculosis case finding by mobile mass radiography, that's doing chest x-rays with people, should now be abandoned. And the rationale was these places in North America and in Europe that had been doing mass screening for TB had found everybody that there was with TB, incidents had dropped to very low rates and it was no longer cost effective or log logistically feasible to do mass screening for TB anymore. Of course, there is no data in here really from those countries in the world nowadays that have got generalized tuberculosis epidemics, such as countries in Africa or many of the countries in Asia. You'll see a little bit of data from, from India out there only. So, uh, WHO, so we basically had no active case finding, no screening for tuberculosis happened between 1974 and about 2010 or so. Um, and kind of at that point, 2013, WHO released its first guidelines for systematic screening for tuberculosis and made a conditional recommendation that where prevalence was above 1%, you could do mass screening for tuberculosis in the community. This is actually based only on data from 1980 onwards, so it ignores all of that historical data um, that is out there. We actually did, I led the, the, the update of these guidelines in 2021, uh, and there's a bit more evidence available. There were a few more randomized trials that have been done, and we lowered the threshold. So where prevalence is about 0.5%, WHO now recommends uh, mass screening uh, for tuberculosis. They also, based on some of the trials that we did, now recommend that you can use new X-ray technologies. And this includes things like computer-aided diagnostic software. So instead of doctors looking at X-rays, 
uh, the computer can look at an X-ray. But you will see, again, from both of these sets of guidelines, including the most recent ones, the data only starts at 1980. So what do those guidelines say? What do those uh, WHO data say? Well, these are basically, if you screen people for TB, if you screen populations, you find more people with tuberculosis. This sort of makes sense, right? If you're going out and doing lots of x-rays, you'll find people with TB. And that kind of holds across all of the different study designs that are, that are out there. There's only ever been three randomized trials that have looked at the effectiveness of, of mass screening for tuberculosis. And again, kind of aligning with this move to, to reintroduce active case findings. So um, what you will see here is that studies were done in Zambia, South Africa, uh, for two of the studies and one in Vietnam. And none of these studies used x-ray as their tool for screening people for tuberculosis. They relied on people reporting symptoms before they went on to get a sputum test to confirm disease, or in the middle study, the X3 study, they actually tested everyone's sputum for tuberculosis, hugely expensive. And, and I haven't put it up on the slide here, um, but uh, they actually achieved very low rates of uptake of screening in that if you ask people to cough, um, randomly selected people in the community, they generally find it quite difficult to produce a sputum sample. So you tend to get, you know, it, it, you're doing very well if you get 50% of your participants to actually complete the screening intervention. And then you'll see that probably contributes to some of these um, findings that we have for effectiveness on outcomes, whereby we only have one trial that has shown an impact on, on prevalence of tuberculosis. So are we missing important evidence on the effectiveness of active case finding in the community? I, I think the answer is probably yes, and I'll show you why in the next few slides. So we we basically did a study in December this year. I kind of got interested in it over the Christmas holidays. And, and this is Glasgow in the 1950s. Um, very poor, highly industrialized, devastated by the war, extremely poor rates of, of nutrition, air quality, uh, and other risk factors for disease um, as well. And Glasgow, in comparison to comparable cities in the UK, had been lagging behind in terms of its TB indicators post-war. So some important dates, start of the NHS in 1948, and drug treatment for tuberculosis became available in about 1949, 1950. And you see many cities had a sharp decline in mortality from TB thereafter, with Glasgow lagging quite far behind, actually, on, on these measures and on other measures as well. And so this is the, 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 the city of Glasgow uh, in 1950. So we, from the archives of the City of Glasgow Corporation, we found the only existing map of the electoral districts of, of Glasgow during that time and digitalized it. So there are 37 wards in Glasgow at that time, divided into five um, divisions here uh, marked with the, the different colors. And, and you'll see that you know, there's quite interesting population uh, demographics going on at this time as well. So these are these each of these 37 different wards. Uh, and you'll see some wards have got a slowly declining population, and some wards have got a quite rapidly increasing population uh, over this time as well. And really important to note that in some wards, particularly the Gorbals, we had the so-called slum clearances starting in the late 1950s. However, they didn't really have a big impact on the population denominators until probably the late 1960s or so when people were moved out to some of the new neighborhoods and on the periphery of the city. So these are the denominators that we're working with. And roughly there were about a million people or so that lived in Glasgow in 1915. So this is the largest ever tuberculosis screening intervention that had been conducted in the world in Glasgow. And it happened over five weeks um, uh, between the 11th of March and the 12th of April in 1957. And, and you know, this is an absolutely huge endeavor by the city of Glasgow, by the health board, by the hospitals. Um, 37 mobile x-ray vans were seconded from across the United Kingdom, along with radiographers and other medical staff, and were distributed to each of those wards. And there was a central screening site in George Square um, as well. Um, and then you had these huge incentives, you know, people were given cards to come and get their x-ray and if they were picked out of a lottery, they got chickens or cigarettes as a free gift. You know, you even had the opportunity, the person who got the 250,000th x-ray won a car and other people got holidays. You know, this is way beyond 
the level of community engagement and incentivization we do nowadays for our TV screening. There's songs and football matches, all sorts of things going on. Huge effort. And overall, 92% of the entire adult population of Glasgow got a chest X-ray within a, this five-week period. This is phenomenal coverage. 30,000 and a half people were, were recalled for a full X-ray. So we do a miniature X-ray first, and then you get a full X-ray if it looks abnormal. 13,900 then went on to be assessed in a chest clinic within a hospital. And ultimately, 2,369 were diagnosed with pulmonary TB, with 58% being males as we would expect. So this is a huge intervention, really unparalleled anywhere nowadays or, or in the past. Uh, so the case, so we were interested in what was the impact of this intervention on the TB epidemiology in Glasgow, and it's never really been analyzed uh, before in any sort of rigorous way. So we went back to the Medical Officer of Health reports for the city of Glasgow, and these are amazingly comprehensive. Every single year, the same tables are reported disaggregating the, the case notifications by age, by sex, by ward, uh, uh, and by pulmonary and extra pulmonary TB status as well. So it makes it very easy to extract these sorts of data from the report. And this is kind of what you end up. I won't flag, uh, I won't um, go through all of this data because I'm going to summarize it in a figure, but it's extremely clean data, which is quite rare historically. And you can see the big impact in 1957 uh, when our intervention went underway. And again, it's easier to see uh, when we actually start looking at this graphically. So we constructed a Bayesian uh, interrupted time series regression model. And this is really allowing us to say we've got a slope before the intervention happened, then we have got a big step change when the intervention happened, and then a different slope in the post-intervention period. Um, and so you can see in between 1950 and 1960, uh, 1956, the pre-intervention period, TB was declining at about 1.6% per year, uh, and roughly linearly as well. And then in 1957, with the intervention, you have a huge impact on case detection, you essentially double the number of people being diagnosed um, with tuberculosis across the city. And then in the post-intervention period, the blue line, uh, you get a huge decrease um, in, in the number of people being diagnosed. So essentially, mm -hmm. you brought a lot of people people's diagnosis earlier in the course of time. So they're, they're ill for a lot uh, shorter period, uh, and they're being diagnosed earlier, less likely to get sick. You'll also note we've got a change in the slope as well. So where we've gone from 1.6% per year decline in the pre-intervention period, we've gone down to about 5% per year. And so you're really shifting the trajectory of the TB epidemic. And when we model compared to the counterfactual, had the intervention not taken place in the gray, we estimate there was about 4,860 TB cases averted by this intervention. So a huge impact. Interestingly, there was no real impact on extra pulmonary TB. So this is TB outside the lungs. That makes sense because we're screening people with chest X-ray. We're trying to find pulmonary TB. And actually, most extra pulmonary TB is amongst young children. So that kind of lends support that our model is saying what it, what it should be doing. And then you won't be able to see most of this, but we're able with our random effects model to model what happened at every ward level as well. And you can see our effect is consistent across all of the wards. And this sort of tells us it's not the slum clearances or other social improvements that are driving down TB epidemics, rather it's a, the, the consistent effect of the intervention across neighborhoods. Really interesting to me, we can break this down by age and sex as well. And, and you can tell a few things about Glasgow here. Firstly, you can tell already that men die young. So we've essentially got this survivorship bias whereby uh, young uh, men don't really make it into their 50s and 60s to the same rate that women do, but that we're detecting more TB amongst, the, amongst the young women. So we're averting cases of TB amongst young women and also amongst the older men that survive to that age. And again, consistent with what we know about TB, we're not really having any impact on the epidemiology of TB amongst young children. We wouldn't expect to see that. So just to kind of bring this all together, this is the largest ever TB screening intervention implemented in a single site in the history of the world. And it's never previously been analyzed for impact. You know, I showed in the first few slides, WHO's evidence only goes back to 1980. So we're missing probably a huge amount of evidence from Glasgow, but also once I started looking into this, 
Similar interventions were done in Liverpool, in North London, in Edinburgh, in Finland, in Sweden, in Japan. And they're all sitting in municipal Department of Health reports, not in scientific publications, so have never been collated for WHO reports. At the time, the case notification rate in Glasgow in the 1950s is very similar to what TB epidemics look like now in countries like South Africa and Malawi, where I, I do a lot of my work. And I think we can learn a lot about what works from this historical data. I said already that this is a massive community engagement uh, event. And, and when I've done active case finding studies and trials, we tend to do a bit of leafleting and go around with some loudspeakers at community meeting. We need to be doing a lot more intensive community engagement activities if we want to get people involved. If you want that kind of 92% participation, you have to get huge buy-in across uh, the community. And, and I think what we saw is substantial and sustained benefit from a single round of mass screening. And, and I sort of think that probably coverage is more important than the screening tools that you use. If you've got a tool like X-ray, where you can very rapidly screen the whole population, you're gonna miss very few people with TB. In the ACT-3 trial, the only positive trial result that we have, sputum collection coverage was less than 50% best, best uh, performing year. So I think coverage is hugely underestimated. So I'd just like to conclude to say that this was a fun study I did in December. It's not really related to most of my usual work, but it was interesting. And I think we can learn a lot from what we did uh, previously. I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. That's fascinating and amazing data. Um, yeah, any questions? Yes. I'll ask a, a serious one and a non-serious one. So the non-serious one is what were the songs at football matches? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was two actually. There was one focused on children and one focused on adults. And there was these, these two characters, I can't even remember their name. It was something like Pimmy TV or something with, with somebody I can't remember, but they were widely played apparently. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> More, I was just wondering where you were going to were you going to try and publish this and whether it's going to yeah. be a historical public health journal or just like kind of mainstream. So, so I've been chatting. So I did a lot of work with WHO a couple of years ago for the most recent guidelines. So um, WHO are interested in this because they've kind of forgotten about a lot of this X-ray evidence. So we are trying to get it published probably in a more contemporary journal, Lancet Public Health, something like this, to try and get a bit more traction. I mean, there's been real resistance to doing x-ray for tuberculosis because WHO said in 1974 we shouldn't do it and nobody had looked at it again so anyway we're trying to trying to shift it a little bit there Caroline do we have any online questions or or hands question from Claire she's wondering if given the current financial pressures on NHS resources this kind of population screening could or would be implemented today so in Scotland, no, we wouldn't do this here. The, the prevalence is far too low. We are an estimated incidence of four per 100,000 in Scotland of TB. Only 200 people were diagnosed with TB in Scotland last year, and it would be prohibitively expensive and probably ineffective to screen the population of Scotland or even Glasgow um, for TB. You'd also diagnose way more for false positives than you would true positives. And you know, if you false positive TB, you're committing yourself to six months of unpleasant antibiotic treatment. However, right now in the world, many countries like you know Malawi, South Africa, where I work, but also big countries like Nigeria, um, Kenya, Uganda, are right now implementing mass screening programs. And I've not really thought through exactly how to do it. They're still going on this model of going around asking people for symptoms. And I, you know, the, the modeling says that the, the at mass screening is likely to be very cost effective, um, but only if it's implemented with screening tools that are likely to achieve high coverage. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Fascinating talk. And I, I wonder if how does this study go into the context of other studies? Like, does it tip the cost effective equation? Would do you think that would change the threshold that we recommend? Yeah, so again, when we did the guideline development group for TB screening guidelines in 2021, there was essentially no cost effectiveness data in there for any sort of approach um, for screening. And there was certainly none about x-ray. So I, I think we need more evidence around that. Um, I, I don't think I'm not aware of much cost effectiveness data that currently exists. But it, you know, x-ray is really, really cheap. 
nowadays, especially with digital chest X-ray, and it's really, really fast as well. So you can screen somebody in about a minute or so um, if if you if you if if you're really committed. So I I and and the amount of population health benefit you gain in terms of disability life years you know averted because TB you know you don't you're not just treated for six months and then you're better. People often have prolonged health problems for the for the whole of their life. So my my sort of suspicion is it would be highly cost effective. But it, you know, as far as I know, there's not much data out there actually. Right. Um, yeah. Well, thank Peter once more. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Right. So next we'll have Fred. Hi everyone, so uh, today I'd like to discuss with you a topic on COVID-19, but um, don't worry, it's not about COVID-19 causing these or that diseases, it's about how COVID-19 could change our um, healthcare delivery and as a result, our population health. Um, so this study was originally thought as an uh, examination of how the pandemic changes people's lifestyle and subsequently their BMI or blood pressure or other cardiometabolic risk factors. Basically, we thought um, because of the pandemic, people stay home more and that may make them less physically active and more obesity as a result, more cardiovascular um, risk factors. And this was also uh, corroborated with another study using the same data um, that showed um, COVID-19 has reduced a large amount of incidents, uh, anti-hypertensive and anti-diabetic medications that would also mean that a lot of people might get delayed or uh, under treatment um, that would result in more severe cardiovascular diseases. And so this study, we use the BHF data science center data. So basically a very huge data center incorporating almost all data that's available on routine data on primary care, secondary, DAF, um, also, some of the social care or um, late data on um, deprivation, et cetera. So um, as a starting point, we just looked at England data, mainly because the Scottish primary health data is a bit sporty. We don't have very updated data on that front. So we use the England data covering um, all the English practices. Um, also, we use the linked um, uh, area-based deprivation data to look at whether there's, there's any inequality involved. Um, so as I said, the original idea was to look at the whether there's changes in risk factors, like whether people who are more obese or having higher blood pressure. But when we looked at the data, we found that that's not very reliable to look at routine data, mainly because there's a huge differences uh, during the pandemic and after the pandemic in terms of the number of risk factors being measured. Um, so we changed the hypothesis or we changed the research objective to look at um, the number of risk factors being measured in primary care. And um, this paper is on the preprint, so in case you want to look at it, it's under review in PLOS Medicine right now. And um, so we mainly use the England general practice um, data on pandemic planning research. Um, so it's a specific data set only for COVID research. Um, and that's why we can um, skim over all the ethical concerns and other issues and use it for uh, all the um, people say that without their explicit consent. And it's linked based on patients' um, most updated residential um, postcode with the de uh, deprivation index up to April 2023, um, last year. And because to avoid any survival effects, people, a lot of people died during pandemic. So we excluded all those people just to look at people who survive until the end of the data period. And um, exposure, year and month, so it's basically look at the trends very similar to Peter's study using the interrupted time series model. And um, so the main um, outcome we are interested in is the number of risk factors being measured in primary care, including um, lifestyle age factor like uh, blood uh, BMI, alcohol consumption, smoking, as well as BP, glucose, et cetera. And we have looked at age, sex, deprivation index, also stringency of COVID-19 restriction, because that might be a factor of when people could go into the GP to see the doctor. So we try to model that into the equation as well. 
And the data is huge. So um, we try a couple of models and that's actually one of the problem with um, both the blessing of the curse of the data because it's like uh, billions of data records. So we can't use a very fancy models. We just use very simple linear regressions. Um, so these are the um, headline figure. So you can see the um, green line is the observed number of risk factor measurements. So the on top left hand side is the BMI. So you can see this huge drop uh, at the start of the first lockdown, and then it's still not picked up um, at the end of the study, which is what, April 2023, last spring-ish. And for it's quite consistent across different risk factors. For well, some of the risk factor is better, like um, for the third one, it's um, alcohol consumption. So um, after the uh, first and second lockdown, um, the measurement of that is going back to the pre-pandemic trend. And this is the estimated missing or reduced number of risk factor measurements. And it's more clear that for some of the risk factor and probably some of the ones that's less um, severe, less acute, they are not measured quite as good as we have been uh, before the pandemic. Um, those include BMI, um, blood pressure, and some of the um, uh, cholesterol measurements. Interestingly, we also found some inequality across age and not much about sex and deprivation, but it's more about age. You can see the um, there's two lines in the figure and the red line is the older people above 60s and the blue, uh, blue green line is younger people. And you can see that for blood pressure, um, the reduction in risk uh, measurement is much greater in the younger people. And similarly for, for both blood pressure, and we would hypothesize that that could be related to um, the backlogs of the primary care practices and people, doctors might be prioritizing um, people with more urgent needs of care, like older people, and may have skimmed through um, uh, younger people. And the other interesting thing that we discover is um, even among the older people, the number of risk factor measurements are much lower than before. And that was hypothesized that there are a lot of teleconsultations, virtual consultations where doctors just don't see them, they can't measure their blood pressure or other things in general uh, in the practice. And for the blood uh, markers, that might be less a problem because doctor could send the patient to some of the centers to take the blood. But usually when those are taken, in general practices, they would also measure blood pressure and other stuff. But if they're measured outside the general practice, in some community centers or healthcare centers, um, other peripheral measurements like blood pressure would not be measured. Um, so as I said before, we also look at sex and deprivation, but interestingly, we haven't found any significant differences uh, in terms of inequality across those two dimensions. But uh, having said that, I have to, um, have to acknowledge that we're looking at the widening or narrowing of inequality. So we're not saying that there's no systematic differences by deprivation in measurement. It's just that the, we haven't found any widening or narrowing um, after the pandemic. So um, uh, we hypothesize that these reduction measurements could be due to backlog, potentially teleconsultation. And I've seen a lot of papers or discussions showing the benefits of of teleconsultation, virtual consultation, which I think most of them are true. But at the same time, I think we need to be a little bit more cautious in the side effects of that, whether we could uh, missing the face-to-face -face, uh, consultation would mean the reduction in measurement. And well, we haven't, we won't be able to look at that in this data, but I think more day, more studies should be looked at that later on. And there's another thing uh, we need to do is what is the implication of the missing measurements? Um, as I said, there's um, studies that look at the uh, missing or delayed uh, prescription. So would that be related to the missing risk factor measurement because the reduced rate or number of um, uh, risk score taking and as a result, less dietin, less blood pressure medications, uh, would that be result in more CBD cases in the future? I don't know, but um, hopefully we should at least at this, at right now we could model it using um, existing data and we should continuously monitoring in the future. 
So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks again, Fred. Um, can I just ask a quick uh, clarifying question, just in case I missed it? Sorry. Um, did you adjust for the total number of primary care visits? So is it is it the rate per visit that's going down, or is it the total number of visits? Uh, both of them. Both. So even yeah. So we look at the raw number of measurements. We look at measurements per visit. We also looked at um, measurements per person. And all of them decrease um, at a similar rate. Okay, interesting. Yeah, right, right there, that's really cool. Uh, nice. <laughs> and did you find variation between local authorities? So, you know, some areas able to maintain services where some did a lot worse? Uh, we haven't looked at it in great detail, but as I said, by deprivation decile, we couldn't find any differences. Yeah. And by rural and urban classification, we also didn't find any differences. So maybe there are some particular areas that could do better. We, uh, but that's something we haven't done yet. Questions now? Caroline, do we have any online questions, Doc? No online questions. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you again. All right. So, last but not least, we have Rowan. Just to ignore the title for now, it's a silly play on words that I actually don't really like. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do the unconventional thing and sort of read a little bit of paper uh, for this. Uh, so I want to speak hopefully coherently about the social ontology, and I'll go into what that is, um, and its presence within public health science. Um, but I hope that this speaks more broadly to our thinking of health, um, even in the simple sense that uh, our sort of more holistic, even our more holistic definitions of health, such as that from the World Health Organization, still often center the individual alone. Um, and this is opposed to the individual that, as a trans-historical condition of their survival, um, and only live in a social and natural environment and that it is from this environment that even the most sort of medical or individualistic interventions sort of occur. Um, so I want to begin by briefly situating uh, public health science, or at least what we would call the develop, or at least the development of what we might now call public health science, um, within an albeit limited historical perspective. Um, in the, the article I've linked here, uh, the demographic historian Simon Shredder charts an interest in health of populations in Europe. Um, he, so this is specifically in Europe. He shows that this sort of interest in health uh, extends from like the militaristic concerns of sovereigns during the emergence of colonial mercantilism in the 1500s um, to the introduction of principles of equality for some uh, in the Enlightenment in the 18th century. Um, to even the beginnings of an academic uh, sort of social epidemiology in 19th century France. Um, looking at the UK in the 19th century, we also have our own examples of a sort of social epidemiology. Um, we can think about Edmund Chadwick's investigations into urban sanitation and mortality, or in sort of the 1830s, or even Engels' concern with premature mortality uh, amongst the working classes in 1845. Uh, more recently than this, the work of like Morris and Titmus in the 1940s uh, related to cases of rheumatic heart disease and peptic ulcer uh, to changes in social conditions such as unemployment. And then, of course, the infamous Black Report, um, which was published in 1980, delved into the causes of health inequalities and the nature of health inequalities. So reflecting on this history, Shredder notes that from its origins, the population health approach has always been stimulated by concerns over the human costs of the excesses of economic and associated urban uh, That is, our modern notions of public health extend from a particular historical period in which European social and economic formations emerging from colonialism, empire, and industrialization have spread to much of the globe. Uh, we can reflect on this in our present as our concerns continue in relation to health. Uh, but we now also look towards the biophysical systems of the planet 
and their stability and what that might mean for health. Um, for moving on, I want to draw particular attention to the fact that the publication of the Black Report in 1980, uh, which perhaps more than any other single document, although that's maybe arguable, but um, has sort of characterized our contemporary understandings of public health and health inequalities. Um, the AIDS publication occurred during the political imposition of an administrative and accounting approach on the UK health sector, um, to which the social epidemiology focused solely on identifying risk factors and their associations was particularly convenient. Um, so moving now on to what we can call social ontology. Um, so I've not referenced this here, but these arguments are from a philosopher called Roy Bhaskar, who is a prominent, if not the sort of most prominent uh, philosopher of science in the UK in the last 50 years. Um, so from his work, uh, at least it attests to the uh, fact that the experimental science of the 20th century, um, if only in practice, often made the error of collapsing ontology, which for now we can think of as statements about being, uh, into epistemology, which we can think of about as about statements about knowing. However, despite this, this empiricism implicitly presupposed an ontology. That is, it is from the necessity of scientific experimentation that we can posit a world beyond the laboratory. In other words, the sequence of events listed in an experimental setup and our observations of these are distinct from the open systems of the world in which these events might occur. Uh, to use a common phrase, the map is not the territory that's mapped. Um, but experiments were not necessary, or rather, these events were not distinct from the structures in which they emerge. There would be no need for experiments. Um, so yeah, what this tells us is that recorded events or states are not necessarily the same as the structures from which they arise. Um, we can think of this purely in terms of physiology, for example, where the etiological structure of an illness is not equivalent to its presentation, but indeed its consequence um, as a recorded event. Uh, by extension, it's clear from the intelligibility of an experimental science uh, that it corresponds and thus is an, an appropriate means of explaining the operation of real structures in the world. Um, but it's at this point that we might question whether sort of purely experimental science or an empiricism is appropriate to explaining all structures in the world. Indeed, if we are concerned about social reality specifically, um, does this merit specific forms of explanation? In other words, why is a social as opposed to a ubiquitously natural science necessary? Uh, this brings us to social ontology. Um, so here I've, I've listed some which I believe are sort of uncontentious aspects of what we might call a social reality that I think demarcate it from sort of non-human or natural phenomena, if we want to call it that. That is, the social world is composed of individuals with complex personalities and capacities um, that exist in positioned relation to one another, whether that's in institutions, communities, families, societies, cities. Um, you have the ability, the ability to communicate and self-reflect um, and our language and our existence is, re is replete with symbolism. Um, our positions often come with distinctions of power, and that is through this power uh, in our present society and in many past societies uh, that uh, people uh, oppress or exploit those in other social positions. Um, importantly, our social formations or structures are processual. They are in motion um, and they are historically mediate, mediated. They involve the reproduction, the transformation of specific formations over time. Uh, we also, which is uh, a bit of crazy, have material artifacts that are imbued with social relations, discourse, and symbolism. Um, it's interesting to think about what money is. So I will sort of conclude by returning to the historical perspective I introduced at the beginning. Born out of the frustration of the sort of accounting approach at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, social ep epidemiology now centers on the notion of causal inference, um, which seeks to sort of replicate the experimental closure uh, obtained under a randomized trial. 
Um, this is crucial work that allows for and builds an understanding of the distribution of health across populations and how various aspects of the social world as recorded events or state relate to this. However, owing to the nature of social reality, um, I want to argue, and I'm interested to hear people's thoughts and also counter arguments. This is only recently that I've put these thoughts in the paper. Um, so owing to the nature of social reality, I want to argue that an empirical science, science alone um, cannot provide adequate explanations of human health. That is, we require a public health science that can provide explanatory accounts of health as it relates to real aspects of the social world, such as social structure, agency, power, history, and the reproduction and transformation of social relations over time, um, among other things. This work, and this is the point I want to make, is necessarily theoretical. Um, I want to suggest that if we are serious about confronting our present crises in health, the severity of which, uh, to be clear, uh, puts the survival of our species into question, at least in certain parts of the globe. Social theory must coexist as a living, breathing practice alongside a social epidemiology. Um, and not be peripheralized as something that medical sociologists do somewhere else. Um, currently, to my eyes, this coexistence is in its infancy. So, uh, to end, I want to say that there is work to be done both in theory and in practice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very thought provoking. Uh, yeah, so shall we have some questions from the room? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, very interesting indeed. Um, so I don't know much about social theory, but do you think that we I agree that social theory must coexist beside empirical studies, but do you think could we in some ways to validate or verify social theory using data or some kind of absolutely yeah, no, I think that that's what I mean. Like it's essential to have both sort of maybe uh, quantitative and qualitative data to sort of build theory. Um, yeah, I don't think any valid theory about the world can sort of exist in contrast to, to that. But it's more about the point that there are aspects of our world that uh, data alone cannot describe their processes in the world, their structures. And this is arguably so in the natural world, but especially so in the social world, um, given the, the reasons here. Um, so we we necessarily have to have explanatory accounts that go beyond the data we have. Um, and there are ways of doing this that might involve like abductive reasoning and that sort of thing. Um, and there will be grounds, better or worse grounds for believing some theory. Uh, but it's more about moving away from this sort of empiricism or the legacy of this empiricism from the last century that we are afraid to speak about ontology and therefore commit that error by collapsing epistemology and so we can sort of provide it within reason. Yeah, from, yeah thanks, that was really enjoyable. Actually. Um, so I'm just thinking, you know, so for probably the last 10, 15 years or so, we've been doing a lot of, or, or funders have encouraged us to do a lot of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research. Mm -hmm. But what I find in practice for public health grants, is that we have a large trial or an epidemiological study with a bit of social science tagged on the side that explains what happened in the trial. Yeah. So how do we get studies that are led by social scientists that address these issues that are not subservient to the you know, kind of the, the data on the trials? Yeah, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Obviously, yeah, this, the, these issues are, you know, what the funding and, and what is sort of yeah, deem the sort of the best means of explaining something in the world. And, and yeah, we'll see the exercise. I'm actually not a social scientist yeah, yeah. myself, so, <laughs> so, I, so I don't really know. But, I, but yeah, I think it is it's a broader, maybe cultural thing. Yeah, thanks. So I'm feeling a bit dim, and this might be a, a kind of stupid question, but I'm just trying to get my head around your argument. So I'm just trying to figure out, so if you think of all the kind of thousands of 
you know, complex models of health determinants, for example, which include lots of kind of political factors, historical factors. And then you, you align that with the need for qualitative information to back up quantitative research. How much more are you arguing is needed above all that, if you see what I mean? Um, I mean, to me, this specifically relates to, well, I think it also on a sort of micro level. So, um, but broader social dynamics. So, for example, it's like we often talk about the relationship between work and health or income and health. Um, but obviously, the very notion of work and the very notion of income and money is a sort of socially and historically mediated thing. Um, so in part, to me, this, this opens up the idea of sort of understanding what health might be in absence of certain sort of social structures that exist in the world. Um, and sort of, yeah, yeah, allowing for health to sort of situate in this broader... You know, because it, it might not be that, you know, if we were to follow sort of an empiricist line, we would say work is good for health, and that's that's a done deal. But outside of that, we might say work is only good for health because of historical factors that you're excluded from the wage market, um, you're not going to have a good time. And that is that was made that way, you know, a few hundred years ago with the enclosure of land. And, you know, and, yeah, whether that should continue or not, maybe it should. Also, good work is good for health. Really crap jobs are not necessarily good for health. So, well, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Carolyn, do we have any online questions at all? Not. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll just ask you one more question because some of the stuff you said there um, got me thinking about the kind of systems stuff so it's all about uh it's particularly the kind of concept of emergence so things coming from the, the bits that we can't describe and then suddenly you've got consciousness or something else mm -hmm. that emerges from things um and a lot of the kind of models that the system scientists are building are trying to basically map what we can measure and let that emergence come within the model so that we can kind of better understand it so is there yeah, I'm just wondering if you think of it in the same way. Is there, is it things we're not able to measure almost in a way, and is it things that that might help that kind of? Yeah, I mean, method? it's things that we're not able to to measure. I mean, inevitably, any measure of the social world is an abstraction mm -hmm. of that world because because of the way the world is, you know. Um, so, like, measure of social position is not this lived reality or the you don't love that. Um, it obviously captures or causal aspects of that um, so I think that is sort of the point at least from this sort of uh, perspective that, that that it would be an error to sort of collapse um, our considerations of the nature of the world into only what we derive through sort of particular forms of being sensitive but that's not to say that there you know there's there's like many ways of understanding the world through data and like new ways of understanding. There's more, at least that's what I'm trying to do. Excellent. Thanks so much. Oh, sorry. One more, one more. Let's go for it. <laughs> We've got time. Um, what are the positive implications then? In a very broad sense, like does it get instilled? Are you shifted towards I've already in the studies. What are the tangible data effects? So, I mean, this is one thing that from from this. Uh, well, this is the way I sort of think about it. For example, health inequalities. Um, to me, the sort of consistency, you know, as a fundamental cause of health inequalities over time across generations. Um, speaks to a sort of social structure that is continually and also transformed, you know, we see it expressed in different ways uh, over time. So I think, like, 
can we say that we reduce? So my PhD, I looked at like uh, whether policy intervention reduced inequalities, but can I say if we see a changes in events or uh, narrowing or you know, broadening uh, between social groups? Um, what degree does that represent, represent a sort of change in inequality versus the sort of structure that produces inequality? It's, it's possible that we could sort of uh, block the sort of expression of a social structure uh, or even transform it in some way, but uh, you know, if that structure still exists, and that's what kind of a fundamental cause of the issue is that structure still exists. Even as the disease patterns change over time, it's gonna, you know, correct. But so it, to me, it's like a refocusing of like what what are the real sort of mechanisms or structures, especially in the social world, that are, are shaping health. Yeah. And if we are wanting to, to change those, how do we do that? Are we are we doing that right way? Yeah. Thanks. Let's like Ronan in and all our speakers. So the next uh, SHW Cross Theme Seminar is next month on the 5th of March. So hopefully see you all there. Thank you. See you. Nice. <laughs> 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 it's fascinating data. And it's, it's anti-user, I swear.